Welcome back, everybody, to the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise here on Madden 21. Today, we have Week 9 of Season 2, as our Jaguars are set to take on the 4-3 and three New York Jets, who, unlike real life, are not god-awful. Last episode, we got a much-needed victory over the Seattle Seahawks, 42-39, an offensive thriller led by a four-touchdown performance from AFC Offensive Player of the Week, Gardner Minshew. Also, cornerback Craven LeBlanc won AFC Defensive Player of the Week, so that's fun. But obviously, the big story here is Minshew. He has not been performing all that well this season. He knows that he has been in rumblings to get benched, and he performed with a game of his life. Before we get to today's game against the Jets, we have another prospect profile. We're going to be taking a look at some of the running backs and wide receivers in this year's draft class. So before we do that, I want to evaluate what we have at those positions, specifically running back, because that's where we're going to start today. Currently, there are two main running backs on this team, Philip Lindsay and Kyra Brooks, both of whom were not on the roster last year. Lindsay was signed to a two-year contract in free agency. He's been the lead running back, and he's been really good this year. There's also rookie Kyra Brooks, who has been the power back. However, I don't think either of them have a long-term back. Lindsay's 27, and he's not under contract forever, and Brooks hasn't really shown me enough to suggest that he can be the long-term starting running back going forward. So, this is a really good running back class, and the top running back in the class is Malik Perkins out of Texas A&M. Perkins is the complete package. He's a great athlete. He's quick, strong footwork, very good change of direction, very good in the receiving game, and... He's a very well-rounded running back, one of the best running back prospects to come out probably since Saquon Barkley a number of years ago. Perkins can be a little bit inconsistent in short yardage situations, and he's not always the toughest of runners, but other than that, he is such a good prospect. The only problem is he is projected to go in the early part of the first round, so it will be pretty hard for the Jags to land him, but it's certainly possible. Let's take a look at some other running backs. Probably won't go as high as Malik Perkins, but could be a really solid complementary options, including Vladimir Poco from Oklahoma State. Poco is the prototypical power back, and that's what he's been for the first three years of his career at Oklahoma State. This year, he's taken over the role as the lead back, and he's actually been really good. But in the NFL, I project that he will most likely just be a power back. Doesn't provide a ton of value on third down as a pass catcher. However, at 6'3", 230, he has excellent play size, excellent strength. He's a tough runner and is the perfect power back for a team looking for one. So I think probably in the third round, if you want to get your power back, look no further than Vladimir Poco. One of my favorite players in this entire draft class out of the University of Florida is Angus Jenkins. Jenkins originally committed to Florida to play slot receiver and then entering his junior season transitioned to running back. Jenkins is obviously a very versatile chess piece and I think head coaches and offensive coordinators in the NFL are going to have a lot of fun with him because they can do a number of different things with him. However, he is a tweener. No set position. He does not have a ton of experience at either slot receiver or running back which is a concern for some scouts. However, I think he's talented enough to where that won't be a huge issue. Jenkins probably will not go until day three, so I think he could be a really good value pick for whoever ends up getting him. Now let's take a look at one of the biggest big play threats in this draft class out of the University of Tulsa, D. Duncan. Duncan only stands at five foot seven, a little bit under 200 pounds, but he has game-breaking speed. When there's nobody in front of him, he is gone. Lightning quickness. Look at that juke move. An excellent play by Duncan. He's a tough runner. Even though he has a small frame, he fights for those yardage. He does need more play-to-play -play consistency. Obviously, he's a big play threat. Defenses have to scheme around him. However, I mean, he only, you're only going to get big plays every once in a while. So, I think when he's not getting big plays, he needs to be a little bit more consistent as a guy who can get four to five yards per play on a consistent basis, and right now that is a little bit of an issue for him. The final running back we will be looking at today is Taj Mayfield III from Baylor. Mayfield is projected to go probably in the third round, although I think he has first-round talent. 
This is a big guy. 5'10", around 229 pounds. He's a thick boy. Strong athleticism. He plays big. He's really good in short yardage situations. He's not a huge big play threat. Only 7 carries of at least 20 yards out of a possible 414 carries so far in his career at Baylor. He does have some off-the-field concerns as well. He's missed time as a freshman and a sophomore due to suspension. So that is a little bit concerning. There is a character red flag, but he is super talented. Now let's take a look at a wide receiver position. And we do have a ton of talent here. Obviously, DJ Chark just signed a huge extension. He's a stud. Not much to talk about there. But behind him, there are some question marks. We have second-year pro LaVisca Chenault, who's had a fairly disappointing season. He has played better as of recent. There's also Nelson Aguilar, who's been a pleasant surprise, but he was only signed to a one-year contract in the offseason. And at 28 years old, I don't think he's a long-term piece for this team. There are a few other young developmental players like Zeke Bowman and Lee Egerton. Watch for them to get more snaps, specifically Bowman, as he does have hit in development. And Egerton is still recovering from a torn labrum he suffered a couple of weeks ago. So there are some pieces here behind DJ Chark, but I think right now Chark is the only sure thing on this receiving core. So don't be surprised if Jacksonville takes a receiver fairly early in this draft class. Unfortunately, this year the receiver class is not quite as good as it was last year, but there are a number of talented players who I think Jacksonville would love to add to the team. The first one is Darnell Middlebrooks out of the University of Nebraska. Middlebrooks is probably going to go in day two, and I think he's probably the best day two receiver in this draft class. I really like his skill set. Not the biggest guy, only six foot, around 186 pounds. However, he does have good athleticism, very solid hands. He rarely drops passes, and he's had good production since his freshman season. Now a senior, he has shown a lot of improvement from season to season. He does need to improve as a route runner, specifically in the short and medium game. His yak ability is solid. However, he has a really bad stiff arm for what it's worth, like really bad. Nonetheless, I think Middlebrooks could be a really good value pick in the middle of the third round. Who knows, maybe Jacksonville will select him. There are four first-round projected receivers in this year's draft class. We're going to take a look at three of them. The first one is Isaac Chittick from Syracuse. Chittick is probably going to go in the late first round. I think he's the third projected receiver in this year's draft class. He can play in the slot and on the outside. Not the biggest guy, but he has good athleticism. Very productive since his freshman season. He does need to do a better job of separation and needs improvement as a deep route runner. I get a lot of Justin Jefferson vibes with Isaac Chittick. Jefferson is a little bit better of a deep route runner. However, other than that, I think these two prospects are fairly similar. Jefferson has so far had a lot of success in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings, so I'm curious to see if Isaac Chittick's career can start off that way too. The second projected receiver in this year's draft class is Tyrone Christmas out of Clemson. Last year, Clemson had two first-round receivers in Callaway Claiborne, who went second overall to the Bills, and Isaiah Thomas, who was a late first-rounder by the Dolphins. To many surprise, I would say Thomas has outplayed Claiborne so far in the NFL. Looking at Tyrone Christmas, he's very well-rounded. He doesn't do one thing particularly well, but... Across the board, there are no major weaknesses with Christmas, and I think he's a very high floor player entering the NFL. If you want a safe pick towards the middle of the first round, your best bet is Tyrone Christmas. I don't think he's ever going to be a great player, and I think a guy like Isaac Chittick has more upside, but I think Christmas is a very safe pick. One of my favorite late round prospects in this draft class, regardless of position, is Casey Shock out of Toledo. His name makes a lot of sense with his play style, as he is lightning fast, elite speed. The first two numbers of his 40-yard dash time will be 4.2 something. Acceleration, quickness, they're off the charts. Change of direction, off the charts. The athleticism with him is incredible. When he has the ball in his hands, he is a machine. However, he drops way too many passes. He's not a great route runner. And he's just very inconsistent. He averages over 20 yards of reception, which shows that he is so, so good with the ball in his hands, but 
He just needs to do a better job of finding ways to get the ball in his hands. Probably going to be an early day three pick. Has an extremely high ceiling, but also a very low floor. The final receiver we're going to be looking at is Westlake's Carter Westwood. I'm very unsure if Westwood would declare, but I think he should. Westwood is the top projected receiver in the class if he chooses to enter his name in the draft. At only 20 years old, he has a ton of potential. Physical freak. 6'5", 221. He can jump out of the gym. Great speed, great quickness. He does a great job of separating off of defenders. If I were to make a knock on him, it's that he's always had good quarterback play, always had good receiver play around him, but he is so good. So here's a quick little slider update. I have had a few people ask to see them. All pro simulation, 10 minute quarters. Also for what it's worth, for pretty much the whole series, I've had the injury slider on 50, but I have moved it up a little bit to 53 to try to experiment. So today's opponent is the New York Jets. They are led by quarterback Sam Darnold. Now in his fourth year, Darnold has shown a lot of flashes the past season and a half and has been rewarded with a handsome extension. The Jets clearly believe in Darnold as their long-term answer, and so far this year he's been very solid. The completion percentage is a little bit low, but the interception to touchdown ratio is pretty good. He is averaging roughly 230 passing yards a game. He's had a really solid season so far for the Jets. In this year's draft, they drafted three Westlake players, including two in the first round. With their first pick, they got offensive guard Brandon Flores, who is a starter, and their second pick was nickel cornerback John Paul Patterson, who happens to have superstar development. Patterson was a very fun player if you watched the Westlake Dynasty. They also drafted cornerback Kyle Harris in the third round. Unfortunately, he's like fifth on their depth chart, so we won't really get a good look at him today. But for those who watched Westlake, make sure to keep your eyes out for number 33, John Paul Patterson in the secondary, and then right guard Brandon Flores. Should be a fun one. Let's take this one down to the new Jaguar Stadium, which still does not have a name. I will announce the name probably next home game. So keep your eyes on that one. It will be announced soon. I have let you guys suggest names for it, and the best one will get picked. The 4-3 New York Jets going to take on the 3-4 and four Jacksonville Jaguars. Jacksonville trying to get to 500. The Jets trying to avoid 500 in what should be a fun one. Jags starting with the football. 3rd and 10, Minshew. Short pass for DJ Chark who makes an excellent play after the catch, bringing it to the 46-yard line for a nice gain of 21, and a Jaguar first down. Second and two now from around the 20. This drive looking good, slowly but surely, as Minshew with a nice throw in the end zone. It's caught by DJ Chark for the touchdown. A hot start today for Chark, who's been quiet in the past couple of first halves. I've noticed so far this season, DJ Chark has gotten a lot of his production in the second half, so it's interesting to see him really stand out in this first drive. Jets offense now with it. Darnold under pressure, and his pass is picked off for rookie out of Auburn, Zaire Wiggins, with his first career interception. One of the few corners drafted over John Paul Patterson in this draft was Zaire Wiggins, the seventh overall pick. He's had an up-and-down rookie season, but it's great to see him forcing his first turnover as an NFL pro. Wiggins has excellent ball skills and expect to see many more interceptions in the future. Third and ten, Minshew would be sacked for only a loss of a yard by Kyler Fackrell, his fifth of the year. Fourth and eleven now, the Jaguars are going to go for a 53-yard field goal from Josh Lambeau. Try to make it 10-0 and doink! No good off of the center of the crossbar. And this game will remain 7-0. So the Zaire Wiggins interception will not lead to points. Jets with it is on first down. Darnold is sacked by Kalevon Chason, his sixth of the season. And to put that in perspective, Chason only had five sacks as a rookie. Quite the breakout campaign for the second year man out of LSU. Third and 22 now. Darnold, a deep ball. What a catch by David Moore. We got a flag, but it's a roughing the passer on Rashawn Babineau. So the Jets... Will still get the first down and more, bringing it to the 13-yard line. What a catch. One-hander by Moore, who did that with C.J. Henderson on top of him. Third and one now from the four. Darnold looking to throw it, and his pass is incomplete. That was Devon Hamilton with the pressure. 
An interesting fourth and one here as the Jets will keep the offense out onto the field. They are going to go for it. Very interesting call as it's a handoff for the fullback, C. Bush, and he does not get it. Kamu Grugier Hill is there with the tackle. Not a guy you see too often making plays, but a huge stop for Grugier Hill. Jags with it. Third and eight as Minshew tries to get it to the tight end, Daniel Romer. His pass is incomplete, and that will pretty much do it for the first quarter. Jaguars lead it 7 to nothing. Solid start for the Jags on both sides of the ball. Jets certainly looking to keep this one competitive as they have it all the way at the Jacksonville 21. Second and 10. Here's Darnold looking to throw it under pressure, and he is sacked by the linebacker, Miles Jack. Jack got hurt in Week 2. Returned after the bye week in Week 7 versus the Dolphins. And this defense is certainly better with Miles Jack on the field. Third and 16 now. Darnold under pressure. And his pass is incomplete. The Jets are in field goal range. It looks like they're going to go for the kick. This is Greg the Leg line from around 44. This one goes right down Main Street. And the Jets are on the board as it is now 7-3. Jets certainly going to compete here. They're not going to let this one be easy for the Jaguars. Is on second and ten. Minshew, a deep ball for guess who? DJ Chark. Are you ready for the Chark attack? He brings it to the 43. First and ten now. It's a pitch for Phillip Lindsay. Lindsay gets an excellent block from DJ Chark, who has had an absolutely insane first half. Lindsay gets it to the 16-yard line for a gain of 27. His fifth run of at least 20 yards on the season. Second and two now. Lindsey gets the handoff, and he will be pushed into the end zone for a Jaguar touchdown. And the Jags will extend their lead with about five and a half minutes to go in the first half. The Jags lead it 14-3. to three. Jets with it. Here's Darnold on first down, going up the middle for Le'Veon Bell. Bell is not the same player he once was, but still a very talented running back and one of the more underrated running backs in the NFL as a pass catcher. Third and five now. It's a screen for Bell, and he is quickly wrapped up by Devon Hamilton. Good start today for Hamilton. Not a guy who you see making plays too often, but he has played really well today. Here is the Jaguar offense as Minshew gets it to the rookie out of Westlake, Zeke Bowman, for a gain of 14 yards and a first down. Second and seven, under three minutes to go in the half. Short throw for LaVisca Chenault, who is quickly tackled by... Another former Westlake Hornet, John Paul Patterson, at the 42-yard line. Third and six now at the 45. Minshew under pressure, and he finds Zeke Bowman wide open up the middle. Bowman only had one catch on the season going into this game, and today he already has two on this drive. Third and eight now from the 30. Minshew scrambling under a ton of pressure. Heaves it up for Njoku, and it probably should have been picked off by the safety. Incomplete. Jackson go for the field goal here. A 47-yard kick for Josh Lambeau. He's 0 for 1 today. Going to make that 1 for 2. A beautiful kick. And it is now 17 to 3. Jets trying to make this game look more competitive before the end of the half. As Darnold up the middle. A tight throw and it's caught. Quick tackle there by Rashawn Babino. Jets do call timeout. Now they're down to 1. From the 49, a deep pass, and it is going to be hauled in by Jamison Crowder. The Jets are not going to waste any time. They are going to go for a field goal. The Jags would call timeout, try to ice Zerline. However, they will not be successful as the Jets are able to score before halftime. It is 17-6, and that will bring us to the intermission. The Jags' offenses look really good today. Another very solid start from Gardner Minshew, proving that... He shouldn't get benched in that he is the starting quarterback of this team. Outside of the interception, Sam Darnold has played fairly well today. 11 for 17, 143 yards. The Jets start the second half on offense. First down, it's going to start with a Jets sweep as that's a loss of two. Josh Allen with the play and Zay Jones, who lost the yardage, is actually shaken up on the play. Hopefully, he'll be okay. Now from the 38, Darnold under pressure, and he is sacked. Quincy Williams and Josh Allen get to the quarterback. Allen now has three and a half on this season. Outside of that Arizona game in week four, I will say Josh Allen 
has been fairly quiet this season. He did start off last year slow and pick it up, so we'll see if this year is similar. Third down, Darnold gets it to Belf, only for a gain of three before rushing out of bounds, and the Jacksonville offense has it back as they try to extend their lead. Second and nine, a quick throw for Nelson Aguilar, who will stay in bounds for a gain of 18. Another very solid day from Nelson Aguilar. His price certainly has to be getting right, getting higher game by game as he enters the free agent market this offseason. First down, Minshew going to keep it on the run. And Joku unable to hold his block long enough. And Gardner Minshew will run out of bounds for a gain of 20. Following play, it's a handoff for Philip Lindsay. He makes a nice cut, but does not get anything. And David Njoku is injured on the play. And Joku's actually been banged up all game. He's had a couple minor injuries, and this one could take him out for the rest of the game as he goes to the locker room grabbing his wrist. Knowing EA Sports, he has any possible injury except for a wrist injury. It'll now be the rookie Daniel Romer out of LSU at tight end for the rest of this one. Third and 19, Minshew tries to get it in to, in to Romer. He is incomplete. And Quinnen Williams is hurt. The younger brother of Jaguars linebacker Quincy Williams, ironically. Speaking of Quincy, he makes a nice tackle there. Le'Veon Bell loses two, so the Williams family has to be happy that Quincy made a nice play, but also not too happy that Quinnen got hurt. Third and nine now, Jets just running the ball here because they're in safety zone. However, Le'Veon Bell will get the first down with a very solid run to the 16. Second and eight now from the 18 at the 420 mark as Darnold has zero time to throw it. Sack number two on the day for Miles Jack, who did not have a sack in the first seven games of the season, and today he has two. Quite the performance from Jack. Third and 12 now for New York. Darnold looking to throw it. He has time, but can't really find anyone, and he would get picked off by Rashawn Pepino. Chase Son was the one with the pressure. Probably should have just thrown it away. Instead, he threw it in the middle of the field, hoping he'd get lucky. And, well, he did not. Dabino with his second interception of the year. Jags with it now is on third down. Minshew is picked off. Nikel Roby Coleman with it, and he has nothing but green grass ahead. Chark chasing after him. An incredible hustle by DJ Chark tackling him at the five. That's like the Buda Baker DK Metcalf play. However, we do have an injury on the field. Gardner Minshew is grabbing his wrist going into the locker room. It is a dislocated wrist, and his day is done. Tyrod Taylor will be at quarterback for the rest of this one. So no more Gardner Minshew, and the Jaguars are going to have to live without him. First down, there's Zaire Wiggins making a nice play. Wiggins has allowed quite a few catches this year. He's been inconsistent, but he's been a great tackler, showing it on that play. Third and goal now, Darnold, short pass is going to be caught at the one, so that leaves the Jets with an interesting dilemma. Fourth and goal at the one. That was LeBlanc with the tackle, as it looks like the Jets are going to go for it again. They've already gone for it on the goal line and were not successful, and it will remain unsuccessful. The pass is broken up by Gerard Wilson's helmet, and now the Jags get it back. Third and four from the six. A short pass for LaVisca Chenault, who gets the first down, so maybe Jackson can get a little drive going. Tyrod Taylor's first pass of the game, by the way. First pass as a Jaguar, to be specific. Taylor now on the ground. A nice throw for DJ Chark. Taylor is certainly more mobile than Gardner Minshew. I think Jacksonville certainly trusts Minshew a little bit more. But you're getting a little bit more of a dynamic element with Tyrod Taylor, quarterback. That'll do it for the third quarter. No points on the scoreboard. A pair of turnovers. And no more Gardner Minshew or David Njoku in this game for the Jaguars. Third and six now opening up the fourth. Tyrod trying to get it to Chenault. A bad pass. However, LaVisca Chenault makes a really nice catch, bringing it to the 12. In one drive today, Chenault has two catches from Tyrod Taylor and only had one catch with Minshew in the game. There's Kyra Brooks losing two, getting absolutely laid out by the linebacker, C.J. Mosley. Second and 12 now. Taylor under pressure, and he will be sacked by Nathan Shepard for a loss of 10. Darnold hyping his teammates up on the sidelines as it's now third and 22. Tyrod looking to throw it. His pass is caught by Chark. 
It gets the Jaguars closer, but not close enough. That was once again Mosley who brought him down. So the field goal unit will return. Fourth and six, a chip shot. 25-yarder for Lambeau. It's good. And the Jaguars are now up by 14 points as it is 20 to 14. Jets have it. They need a big comeback here. Down by two scores. And it has to start now. Darnold on first down. A nice pass is going to be caught by Jamison Crowder who will lunge over to get the first. Third and three now at the 28. Four and a half to go. Darnold, short pass as Herndon will make Schobert stumble and then gets popped out of bounds by C.J. Henderson. Christopher Herndon doesn't seem too phased about it. Now from the 11, handoff for Le'Veon Bell and he is going to find the end zone. Gerard Wilson really did not give an effort on that play, number 26 for the Jaguars. He just let Le'Veon walk in. And it is now a one-possession game. The Jets are not out of it. The Jaguars choked an 18-point lead in the fourth quarter a couple weeks ago to the Dolphins. So they can certainly choke a fourth-quarter lead here against the Jets. First down, there's Lindsey with a nice run out of bounds to the 47. Big third down and 11 now for Jacksonville from the 46. Tyrod Taylor going to look to throw it up the middle. He was trying to get it to Aguilar, and it's broken up by the defense. Lucky that wasn't picked off. Now the Jets have a chance to tie it. Under two minutes to go, a nice pass for David Moore. Quickly wrapped up out of bounds by Ronnie Harrison, but still a good first down for the Jets. Now at the 45. New York has all three timeouts, by the way, as Darnold looking to throw it, and he will be sacked. The big defensive tackle, Sheldon Rankins, gets to the quarterback, forcing a loss of eight. Third and 18 now. The Jets were forced to use a timeout as one of their offensive linemen got hurt. Darnold, deep ball, and it is broken up. It looks like Ronnie Harrison was the one going for the catch, and Jamison Crowder just tried to knock it out of his hands. So now fourth and 18. The Jets have to go for it. I would imagine Darnold is going to heave up a deep pass, and that's what he does. And it is going to be picked off by Gerard Wilson. So the Jaguar defense, who only has, I think, two interceptions since week one, gets three interceptions today. The two rookies, Wiggins and Babineau, and now one of the captains, Gerard Wilson. Jacksonville trying to end this game, and they'll do just that. Tyrod Taylor with a short pass for Daniel Romer. The two players who had to step in today due to injuries. That's how this game ends. A close fight, but Jacksonville... Gets their second straight win, 20-13 over the Jets. Both teams now have records of 4-4. Four and four. Gardner Minshew going to the locker room. His wrist looks completely fine. Okay, then. So, uh, looking at the QB stats, we're going to start with us. Gardner Minshew was really good in the first half. Was not particularly great in the second half before his injury. He went 2-for-8 with the interception in the second half, but he did go 12-for-15 with a touchdown in the first half. Tyrod Taylor in relief played pretty well, in my opinion. So if Minshew does start to struggle again, I mean, we certainly have a capable backup at Tyrod Taylor. Sam Darnold threw three interceptions. I don't think he played all that bad, though. Two of the interceptions were very bad throws, and then the last one, he just had to force it up, so I can't really blame him for that one. Philip Lindsay played very well again today for the Jaguars. Le'Veon Bell with a touchdown. DJ Chark with one of his best games of the year. Eight catches, 164 yards, and a touchdown. He was phenomenal. Jamison Crowder with eight catches for the Jets. David Moore was their next leading receiver. Our next leading receiver was Zeke Bowman, who only had 37 yards. So a quiet day for the rest of the receivers outside of Chark. Uh, the pass blocking was pretty good for us again. Our pass blocking continues to play, to play really well. Our pass rush was pretty good today, too. Two sacks for Miles Jack, one for Rankins and Chase on, half a sack for Josh Allen and Quincy Williams. So that's five sacks total. Nikhil Roby Coleman had an interception for the Jets, and for us, Rashawn Babineau, Gerard Wilson, and Zaire Wiggins each had picks. Wiggins, obviously, his first of his career. Babineau with his second interception of his career. So that'll pretty much do it for the episode. Next episode, we'll be facing off against the 2-6 Indianapolis Colts led by rookie quarterback Rodney Allen. I've got some good news. Gardner Minshew and David Njoku are not on the injury report. So they will be back healthy next week for our divisional matchup against the Colts. Miles Jack ended up winning AFC Defensive Player of the Week with 12 tackles and 2 sacks. 10 of his tackles were in the first half, by the way. 
So that'll end the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you're excited for this Colts game. I know I am. I'm out. Peace. Thank you.